Hello, welcome to our tutorial today. And before I start, I request you to subscribe, like, and share my YouTube channel. I'm David. Today, I'll be taking you through reinforced concrete design um, using BS8110 code. And uh, our first lecture will be on reinforced concrete slab. Now, what is a reinforced concrete slab? We can say a slab is a reinforced concrete plate element forming floor and roofs in building which normally carry uniformly distributed loads. So the floors and roofs, concrete roofs and uh, concrete floors in our houses is what we call the slab. Now this slab, they behave primarily as flexural member and their design is similar to that for beams. Now, the design procedure, the design process for the slab is the same as the design process for the beam, but we have slight differences. One, for the slab, the width or breadth is fixed to be one meter during calculation. And then the shear stress is usually low in the slab, except where they are heavy concentrated load. Then compression reinforcement is seldom required. What it means that what should not that the design procedure for slab is the same as that of the beam, except for the case of slab, width of one meter is used, then shear stress is very low, and therefore shear reinforcement is not provided, and then compression reinforcement is also not provided. Now, let us look at types of slab. We have criteria to classify slab. One criteria we can classify them based on the construction. Based on construction, we have what you call a solid slab. Solid slab is a slab that is supported by beams or on two or all sides. So this is a solid slab. You see, these are the common slab we normally see. They are called solid. They are supported by beams on their two or all their side. Then we have what you call a flat slab. Flat slab is a slab that is supported directly by columns or walls without beam. So for a flat slab, there are no intermediate beam. That's why you see here the column cap. Column cap to help reduce the effect of the shear stresses on, on the slab because there are no beams. And then we have what you call the ribbed slab. Ribbed slab from the word ribbed, it means the slab has a series of ribs or joists between the top and bottom slabs. This is what you call the ribs. This one running here, they are called the ribs. So they are called ribbed slab. Then we have another slab we call waffle slab. Waffle slab is a slab that is constructed with a series of ribs or cells that form a grid pattern. So these are ribs. Now, th these ribs are interconnected in a way that they form grid. So this is what we call the waffle slab. Then we have a hollow slab. From the word hollow, it means it's a precast concrete slab with voids or hollow course running along its length. So you find the slab has only the top part, the, the outer parts, but inside here, it is hollow. Like, for example, it's here, there. Uh, circular holes or circular hollow course through the slab. So it is normally precast. Precast means it is made in the industry or somewhere else and only carried and fixed at the point where it is being used. So those are classifications based on construction. Then we go to Another classification we say based on load distribution. Here we look at how does the our slab carry the load? How does it distribute? Now, one, we have one-way spanning slab. Now, look at this slab. We have the longer span is LY and shorter span is LX. So when, when someone tells you this is a one-way spanning slab, technically it means a slab that is supported by two parallel beams or walls and load is transferred to the supporting element in one direction only. For example, we have this beam, the bottom beam and the upper beam. So looking at this now, the load only comes to this beam. The load comes in one direction only. This is just one 
direction. Now, what you need to note is that for one way spanning slab, the ratio of longer side given by Ly to the shorter side Lx is either equal to two or greater than two. So if you divide the longest span of a shorter span and get a value of two, then you conclude that it's a one way spanning slab. Now for the one way spanning slab, the reinforcement is placed in one direction perpendicular to the span. So what you mean, this is the span. So reinforcement will be placed perpendicular to the span. So this is what I mean. So this is our span from here to here. This is our span. So reinforce, reinforcements will be placed here perpendicular to the span. So they run this way. This will be our reinforcements. This will be our reinforcements. Then we have another type in terms of low distribution, we call it two-way spanning. Now for two-way spanning, we say it is a slab that is supported by four or more edges and the load is transferred to the supporting element in both directions. So you see, we have this direction and then this direction. So we call it a two-way spanning slab. Load is transferred to the supporting element in both or in two direction. Now, the ratio of longer side Ly to shorter side should be less than 2. So if you divide Ly and Lx and you get a value of 1.9, then automatically our slab will be two-way spanning slab. Another thing you should note is that the reinforcement is placed in both directions perpendicular to the span. Now here, we have two spans because it is spanning it is spanning in both directions. What we mean we shall have this kind of reinforcement. We'll have reinforcement here running from here to there. So we shall have this kind of reinforcement. So which is this one here, this reinforcement is perpendicular to the Ly. And then you also have another reinforcement. That is what we mean running perpendicular to Lx. So we shall have this kind of reinforcement. So we have re reinforcing bars in both this direction and the other direction. Then now those are based on load distribution. Now we have support conditions and behavior under load. So for support conditions, we have what you call a fixed slab. This is a slab supported on all four sides and cannot move or rotate at its support. So we call it a restrained slab. Then we have a simply supported slab. This is supported on two opposite sides by beams or wall and is free to move or rotate at its support. Then finally, we have a continuous slab. This is supported on three or more side by beams or wall and is continuous across its support. Now, um, what you mean by continuous slab? It means this is a slab that is flows over the support to the other direction, meaning it is continuous over the support. Then now we can go to what you call design procedure. We have a general design procedure for reinforced concrete slab. Now, the first step we need to do is to determine the value of thickness given by H. Now, for you to determine the thickness here, we, we have uh, things to consider. Now, the thing we consider here is the support conditions. Like, is it a cantilever? Is it simply supported or continuous slab? Because for each of these category, they are given ratios that you can use. For example, now, if, if you want to design a continuous slab, and you've not been given the thickness, you can find thickness by using the formula. Thickness will be equivalent to the shorter span Lx divided by 36 plus concrete cover plus diameter of reinforcement bus over 2. Now, if it is a simply supported slab, now thickness H will be 
shorter span over 26 plus concrete cover plus diameter of reinforcing bus divided by two. For cut level, it will be um, shorter span over 10 plus concrete cover plus reinforcement bar diameter over two. So I say phi is reinforcement bar diameter. Now, when you come to the, the, this table here, now I need you to understand this. Now, when you have a continuous slab, when you are doing initial sizing, you, you take a value of 36. You take a value of 36 that we have used in this equation here. But if you want to check for deflection, we use a value of 26. The reason why we take 36 in initial sizing is that so that when we, we design it, 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 it has a high likelihood of passing our deflection test. But if you take 26 and use it here, when you arrive at the point to check deflection, the, your slab is likely to fail. That's why we take a higher denominator for each of the slab. We take a higher denominator so that during the test, it, it will not fail. So now when, in, when doing initial sizing, you use for continuous slab, you use 36. Um, for simply supported 26 and cut lever, you use 10. But for deflection check, you will see in, a, in an example, you use 26 for continuous, 20 for simply supported, and uh, 7 for cut lever. Now we have another thing we call concrete cover. Now, Concrete cover, the most suitable concrete cover depend on exposure conditions. So it is given in table 3.3 .3 of BS8110 as well as aggregate size. So the minimum concrete cover should be, now for you to determine the minimum concrete cover, you take the maximum aggregate size plus five millimeter. So if you are told that the aggregate size would be 20 millimeter, then automatically, your concrete cover should be 20 millimeter for maximum aggregate size plus five millimeter becoming 25 millimeter. And also exposure condition, what do we mean? We, we have like concrete being used in chemical plants. Then the concrete cover should be large enough to protect the reinforcing bus from being corroded by the chemical. So those are the two we have exposure conditions as the determinant of concrete cover and also the maximum aggregate size. Now let's move on to loading. Now loading, we have two loads. We have what you call characteristic dead load given by GK and characteristic imposed load. Imposed load, sometimes it's called live load given by GK. Now, what do we mean by dead load? Dead load is Basically, the weight of the permanent components of a structure that remains constant over the lifespan of the structure and is calculated based on the weight of the material used to construct the building or structure. What we mean for the case of our slab, the dead load will be the weight of the slab itself, what we call the self-weight. We also add the weight of sailings and the weight of partition. Now, assuming that we our slab is not the topmost, we have a floor on top of it, we might have some partition wall. So what we mean by dead load is that load that we remain constant and acting in the same direction for the entire life of the structure. That's why we call it dead. It doesn't change. Then we have imposed or live load. This is the weight of temporary component of a structure that can vary over time and is calculated based on the maximum expected weight of the load and the area it occupies. So we say it vary over time. For example, the weight of human beings in a building is a live load or imposed load because today there could be 10 people in a building, tomorrow there will be 20 people. So that load keeps on varying or the furniture. You might buy a bigger furniture, uh, large weight furniture or a small furniture. So that particular weight is subject to varying. So we call it impost or live load. Now, the design load. Now, to for you to obtain the design load, the design load is calculated by you multiply the dead and live load with the appropriate partial factors of safety. So basically we say design load is given by 
factor of safety times dead load plus factor of safety times imposed load. So design load is basically, now from BS 8110 table 2.1, you find that the partial factor of safety for the dead load is 1.4 and partial factor of safety for the imposed or live load is 1.6. So in short, we say design load is given by 1.4 GK plus 1.6 QK. Now we have what you call effective span. Effective span mostly applies to one way spanning. Now effective span of the slab is taken at the lesser of now. Um, when you have a question, we have two ways. You can either determine the effective span by taking the center to center distance between the bearing. The bearing, it can be supports, it can be beams or wall. So the center to center distance or the clear span between support plus the effective depth of the slab. Now, if the two occur at the same time, you take the lesser value, the smaller value of the two. You take the one which is smaller. But if only one one way is given to determine the effective depth you only work with that way for example now assuming you are not you've not been given center to center distance but only given clear distance between support plus effective depth of the slab then automatically your effective span will be clear distance between support plus the effective depth of the slab because for that matter you will not be knowing the center to center distance so we will take b as our effective span and now we have now spanning mode and analysis so how our slab span determine how we shall analyze it and remember we said in the above uh, above page that uh, we have one way and two way spanning slab now what you need to determine is the value of ly over lx we said that if the ratio is less than two then it means the load is spanning both direction and our slab is two-way spanning. But if the ratio LX is greater than two, then we say the slab is one way. So for one way, we will just proceed normally like we do for the beam. But for two-way spanning slab, the value of LX are used to determine coefficient used to calculate moment according to BS8110. So we shall use table 3.14. 3.14 and 3.15 in that particular matter. Now, what you need to understand is that now we also have two cases. If our two-way spanning beam is simply supported, we shall use table 3.13. So 3.13 we shall obtain moment along the X span is equivalent to the coefficient in X multiplied by design load terms. Lx squared moment along y will be equivalent to coefficient along y multiplied by the design load times span x squared. Now, this table I'll show you how to use it. So this is if it is simply supported. We said simple for simply supported slab is a slab that can move or rotate about its support. But now we have what you call restrained slab. Restraint is equivalent to fixed support slab which cannot rotate or move about their support so we use table 3.14 and table 3.15 it will help us to obtain moment along the shorter span x and moment along the longer span y we shall obtain this this beta s x it means just moment coefficient along x span or span x short span and then beta sy just mean moment coefficient along the longer span or ly now after we determine this one after we have determined the moment now this one will have determined our bending moment now we can go and compute a value k now k is normally given by design moment divided by bd squared fcu Remember D is effective depth, which is obtained by taking the thickness of slab minus the concrete cover minus diameter of reinforcing bus over two.
what I mean is that uh, this D here, D is equals to H, which is overall thickness minus cover, concrete cover, minus diameter of reinforcement bar divided by two. This is how we obtain the D. Now, after getting that, now, normally, this value of K here, if you substitute here the values, remember, when you substitute the value of moment will be in terms of kilonewton meter. So you'll have to multiply it times 10 power 6 to convert it into equivalent units here because B is in millimeter, D in millimeter, and FCU is in newton per millimeter squared. Now, this is what I was telling you that Effective depth D is equal to thickness of slab H minus concrete cover C minus a half diameter of reinforcement bar. Now, if you find a case where the value of K is more than 0 0.156, which will be rare in, uh, in the design of slab, it means you have to provide compression steel. Now, from there, we'll move to what you call arm, arm Z. Z is equivalent to D. Now Z is determined in two ways. We have D into bracket 0 0.5 plus square root of 0 0.25 minus K over K over 0 0.9. So let me show you. This square root covers from here the entire of this. So this square root covers up to this square root covers up to here, up to here. So you find that D, now Z is going to D into 0 0.5 plus square root of 0 0.25 minus K over 0 0.9. This K you found above here, you come and substitute it. So, or Z is equivalent to 0 0.95 D. Now, if you compute the value in this bracket here and you get a value more than 0 0.95 D, then you discard it and use Z is equivalent to 0 0.95 D. Now, the maximum value of Z allowed is 0 0.95 D. So if you compute this one, for example, if I compute 0 0.5 plus square root of 0 0.25 minus K over 0 0.9, this value here in, I get it is 0 0.98. Then I will disregard it and just say my Z will be equivalent to 0 0.95 D. Like you take the lesser of, 0 0.5, 0 0.95 D and this one here, whichever will be less, you use it. Then from there, you calculate the area of steel. A area of steel required. Area of steel required is equivalent to design moment divided by 0 0.87 FY. FY is the strength value of steel multiplied by the z this arm we calculated here this z you put it here but now remember this minimum area of steel once you get this area you leave it and remember this area will be millimeter squared per meter width now you have to compute minimum area of steel this is the what is provided by the code that uh, the area provided must at least be equivalent to this. So it's equivalent to 0.13% times breadth times thickness of the slab for high yield strength steel, for, which means FY 460 Newton per millimeter squared, or minimum steel is equivalent to 0.24% breadth times thickness for mild steel. Mild steel as a strength of 250 newton per millimeter squared. So remember this, once you calculate the steel area, put it to test, test if it meets the requirement of the minimum area of steel. Now, once you get it, for the case of um, one-way spanning, it will only have reinforcement in, in one direction, which is perpendicular to the span. 
But for the case of uh, two-way, it will have reinforcement in both directions because the load is applied or is distributed along two directions. Now we go to shear in slabs. Design shear stress at any cross section. Now we know that shear stress is given by, because stress is prices given by force over area. Now force here is shear force divided by the area is breadth times effective depth. Now this value here, this value of shear force will not exceed 0 0.8 the square root of the characteristic strength of concrete FCU. But concrete shear stress, concrete shear stress here. Now for you to obtain concrete shear stress, you will come here, you will compute 100 AS over BD. So after you get 100 AS over BD, remember this AS is the area you obtain from the table, not what you calculated, because after you calculate and test it meets the minimum, you will go to a table and obtain an area that is either equivalent to what you calculated or slightly more than that. So that area you take from the table is what you use here. Now, let me show you how we can obtain the value of VC. Now, so that table, Table 3.8 is this way. We have 100. We have 100. A. S over B D. B D. Then we have D, which is effective, effective depth. Now, what you do, you come, once you compute this value here, so we normally come this way, it takes this way, and now our D, our D value, now assuming our D is 125 millimeter, 125 millimeter, and our value of 100 AS over BD is 0 0.52. So I'll come, I'll come along these, these 100 AS over BD axis. This is table, table 3.8. Remember this is table 3.8. 8 of BS8110. So I will move along the 100 AS over BD axis until where I get 0 0.52. 0 0.52, I will locate it. And then I will move with it horizontally. And then also now where I have D of 125 millimeter, I will move with it here. So This value here, where they intersect, is my VC. This which is the concrete shear stress. So that value, sometimes you will have to extrapolate. Sorry, this one is, um, this one, remember, it is a 5.2 because you have 0 0.52. So 0 0.52 along 100 AS over BD, then you move up a straight line, horizontal line, then along effective depth, you, you spot where there is 125 millimeter and also draw a straight line. So where they meet, the value obtained there is your VC. Sometimes you'll have to extrapolate, which is okay. So that will be our co concrete shear stress. And like we said, you find in most cases that the concrete shear stress, VC, is what the slab can carry, the shear stress the slab can carry. But the design shear stress is what, what is coming from the external or design load. So if the concrete shear stress is greater than the design shear stress, then we don't need shear 
reinforcement. And as we said, normally for the case of slab, the concrete shear stress will be will always be greater than the design shear stress, meaning we don't need the shear reinforcement. Then now we go to deflection check. So for deflection check, we compute what you call surface service stress. Now this you can get it in table 3.10 of BS8110. So which says that uh, the service stress, the service stress is equivalent to, which is FS equivalent to two FY AS required. AS required means what you calculated divided by three AS provided. This is what you read from the table. So this AS provided means what you read from the table. Then AS required is what you calculated before going to look at the table. We multiply by one over beta. But in most cases, we assume beta is one. So meaning we now do away with this term here and remain with them. Service stress is two FY AS required over three AS provided. So ignore this one because we assume it is one. Now modification factor is computed by 0 0.55 plus 477. These are constant is given in that uh, table 3.10 minus FS, what we calculate here, divided by 120 into 0 0.9 plus design moment divided by BD squared, which should be less or equal to 2.0. So if you compute this value and you get a value of 2.5, just take it as 2.0. But if you get a value of 1.5, use 1.5, provided it should not go beyond two. When it go beyond two, you use 2.0. So permissible deflection, permissible deflection, it means the deflection that can be allowed before our slab fail. So permissible is equivalent to, you take the modification factor you obtain here, you multiply by deflection check. I remember we have table 3.9 where we said we have a deflection check is 20 for simply supported, 26 for continuous and seven for can't lever. So this value obtained here, you multiply by those values corresponding to the uh, the slab you are analyzing using table 3.9 of BS8110. Then now uh, after you calculate permissible, now you will come and calculate the actual deflection. So actual deflection will be equivalent to you take now the effective span divided by the effective depth, which is D. Now, if the actual deflection is more than permissible deflection, then it means our deflection criteria, our deflection test has failed because it means our actual slab, when we implement that particular construction, it will deflect beyond what is allowed, meaning that our structure will no longer perform our intended purpose. So the actual deflection should be less than the permissible deflection. Otherwise, you increase the thickness of the slab. So if you find the actual is greater than the permissible, then you have to increase the thickness of the slab. Otherwise, it will fail in terms of deflection check. Thank you very much for being with me. And uh, next, now we are going to do an example. Just a reminder, I request you to subscribe, like, and share my YouTube channel. Thank you very much.